In 2014, I was teaching a graduate engineering class at Santa Clara University and had a dedicated student who frequently came by my office. We were chatting and he said, I often try to figure out if my professors are actually professors, instructors, or teachers. I asked him what he meant by that and he assured me he'd tell me at the end of the quarter. I won't make you wait that long as we only have 18 minutes. Fast forward, prepping for the final, and I said, I gotta ask, professor, instructor, teacher. He said, right, you're a teacher. I said, okay, great, thank you. Can you elaborate? And he said, sure. See, professors, they like to profess. They actually don't even need students in the room. <laughs> they like to hear themselves talk and hear how smart they are. Instructors, they need students in the room. They need to instruct them, tell them what to do. Teachers teach. They genuinely care whether their students are learning. So when I say that you are a teacher, I mean that as the highest compliment. That story has stuck in my head for 10 years. I'm proud of it mostly because I think it captures how I live my life. It's the reason I left industry for a teaching career. But how did he know? Why did he choose teacher? Before I continue, I'd like to ask you to imagine yourself learning something in your optimal learning environment. It could be an academic subject, a musical instrument, whatever. I want you to think about who else is in the room. Anyone? What else is in the room? Is it a room? Most importantly, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel comfortable enough that if you were to make a mistake, you would be okay? Fundamentally, I think that's one of the most important things in learning, being truly comfortable with making a mistake and then being willing to reflect on that mistake to turn it into something productive. So going back to my question, why teacher? How was it so clear to him that I prioritized learning? One, I provided a comfortable environment where he could productively struggle. And two, he was a committed learner. It took both parts. Even the best of teachers cannot force the unwilling to learn. Today, I'd like to share my thoughts on how teachers and learners can enhance their relationship with productive struggle to allow for transformational learning. Science supports this, by the way, as extrasynaptic connections are actually formed when we learn via mistakes. If we can create environments that are comfortable enough, learners aren't focused on the struggle. They're just learning. Unfortunately, there are many challenges that hinder productive struggle. The first is that most of us, if not all, have been conditioned over time by society, the education system, peers, to avoid mistakes. Struggle is equated to a lack of talent. Mistakes are embarrassing. Society has trained us to be hyper aware of what others think. I have two daughters, ages seven and nine. I've watched their minds grow since they were very young, and they consistently reinforce how beneficial it is to not be afraid of making mistakes or asking questions. I frequently encourage my engineering students to channel their inner five-year-old because that person knew how to learn. If I was quite a bit younger and I were to trip and fall, I wouldn't give it a second thought. When kids fall down, they get back up. Turns out it's a pretty productive thing to do. If I fell here today, as an almost 50-year-old, I would be wondering exactly how viral this video would go for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> when adults make mistakes, we often look around to see if anyone noticed, or worse yet, if it was recorded, or if we're gonna end up on TikTok. And what's TikTok? <laughs> like I said, society trains us to care about the wrong things. Sadly, in the classroom, this fear of failure manifests itself in a very damaging way. My students share that they often avoid asking or even answering questions in their classes. Their arm gets heavy with the weight of carrying the expectation of not asking a stupid question. Imagine the shame of not knowing something in a classroom where you are literally paying to be taught the material. As learners, we need to ask ourselves, what is stopping us? As educators, we need to explore what we can do to stop our students from stopping themselves. There's a building not too far from here. 
that has a message. What would you do if you weren't afraid? It reminds those walking by to avoid this trap. The building? Facebook. Meta. This fear of failure is not confined to academic environments. Grown professionals benefit from being reminded of this daily. This is related to the second major challenge. This whole thing is really hard to do in schools because schools have grades, and grades complicate things. Students are routinely put in the position where they have to decide between learning the material or getting a good grade. That is a terrible decision to have to make. Productive struggle takes time. When time is limited, learning becomes secondary. When a student digs in, it's usually because they enjoy the class, they feel comfortable, and they're willing to spend that time productively struggling. On the teacher side, there are similar challenges. One specific one is that it's hard to know exactly how much help one needs. I'm reminded of a birthday party I was attending a few years ago. My daughter was playing on the swing and I was eating cake because I like cake. My daughter fell off the swing. She was fine. I saw her. She saw that I saw her. I kept eating my cake. <laughs> she was in the process of getting up when another parent swooped in to help. I know they meant well, and I'm certain the look they shot me was only out of concern for my daughter. But in that moment, I couldn't help but be disappointed that she had just been robbed of an opportunity to be independent. There are helicopter parents. There are helicopter teachers, educators, tutors, just waiting to swoop in and answer questions. They mean well but their approach often comes at a cost. I've been emphasizing the benefits of productive struggle, but I firmly believe that the challenges mentioned so far are addressed if we focus on the importance of gaining and fostering confidence. If one is truly confident, any learning environment becomes more comfortable. Fostering confidence comes from providing opportunities for people to shine independently letting them pick themselves up from time to time and know that they'll be okay. It can look lazy to foster confidence, as easy as eating cake. But a trained educator is watching for those moments when they are truly needed. The balance between providing genuine support and being a superfluous crutch is a delicate and important one. For educators, the key is making space for mistakes to happen, celebrating them when they do and being ready to support the next vital step of reflection and learning. And if a student is getting frustrated, knowing when to jump in and wait for another stronger learning opportunity later. I'd like to share a common exchange I have with my students. And educators, you can feel free to use this script if you'd like. A student will come in my office. I'm stuck on the homework. I don't know how to do number one. What have you tried? And they'll show me some work. Why did you stop? I didn't know what to do next. What are your options? I could have done this or this or this, but I wasn't sure which one was right. Those seem like good choices. You should try them. I'm going to go work with another student. I'll be back in a bit. A few minutes later, I'll come back. How's number one going? I finished it. I'm stuck on number two. What have you tried? Yes, of course, there are times when I need to dig in and review content, but often students just need to be given the gift of time to show themselves what they're capable of. This idea comes up a lot in my life. I happen to really enjoy writing and solving puzzles. I've found that experienced puzzlers have the confidence that if they try enough things, something will eventually work out. They know the process. Newer puzzlers often have the right idea, but won't see it through until they can confirm the plan. It's similar at home. I love helping my daughters. Sometimes I'm a little slower to respond. Dad, can you come help me? Sure, be there in a minute. A few minutes later. How's it going? You still need help? Nope, figured it out. <laughs> now, good teaching actually goes much deeper than this and is built on strong empathy that not only puts one into the knowledge space where the learner exists, but also considers the barriers to learning that the student is facing. I'm going to share three such significant barriers and strategies to combat them. 
Studies have confirmed that these barriers can affect everyone. Nobody is immune. However, sadly, they are even more prevalent in underrepresented and disadvantaged groups. The first, having a fixed mindset. This is the opposite of having a growth mindset, where one believes that the appropriate effort will result in positive change. The reality is, most of us have areas where we have a fixed mindset and areas where we have a growth mindset. A good teacher can help a student see where they have a growth mindset, soccer, video games, and apply that positive and well-designed effort to areas where they struggle. Another common barrier, imposter syndrome. Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? That's a rhetorical question. I know the answer. Imposter syndrome is based on pluralistic ignorance. The idea that we doubt ourselves and assume that we're the only ones thinking that way because nobody's talking about it. My mom got me through many imposter moments. My parents filled me with the belief that I could attend college even though they didn't. It was 15 years too late when I learned that I wasn't alone in feeling like I didn't belong at Stanford while I was working on my PhD. To learners that feel this way, I have talked with thousands of students. You are not alone. And educators, I have it on good authority that you're not alone either. You should feel free to share. Your students will benefit from knowing that you also suffer from this. My own imposter syndrome even limited my tutoring opportunities when I was younger, and I was afraid of what might happen if I didn't know an answer. Today, I embrace the advice that I don't know is okay. If you're working with a student and you don't know the answer, that's a moment to cherish because it builds trust, it humanizes you, and it shows the student that it's okay not to know. Plus, it gives you an opportunity to showcase how to handle the situation. A third barrier is stereotype threat. Dr. Claude Steele shares that when a negative stereotype exists about an identity that you identify with, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Not because it's true, but because when you end up struggling, like everyone does, those with a negative stereotype attribute the struggle to the unexpected difficulty and subconsciously waste brain cells trying to figure out why. Those without the stereotypes to ignore can more easily embrace the struggle for what it is, a normal step on the way to success. This is the epitome of unproductive struggle, the kind that leads to throwing in the towel before learning happens. Dr. Steele shares that building identity safety is the antidote to stereotype threat. The studies support the value of confidence and how it is fostered. Older siblings are frequently in a position of mentorship, and that can lead to higher confidence. My daughter's school combines pairs of grade levels in one classroom, giving all students the chance to mentor. They also get to reinforce what they learned while building upon it. My youngest is thriving in this role. In 2011, I founded a nonprofit based around the principles that I've been discussing. Our program trains low-income and first-generation college students to be high-quality tutors who provide free STEM tutoring to low-income middle and high school students. Training is centered around the idea of creating academically risk-free, safe, and comfortable environments where students are encouraged to embrace mistakes and opportunities to learn. Specifically, tutors are trained to help their younger counterparts overcome the mindset barriers in part using the techniques I've shared. Fundamentally, we challenge our tutors to work themselves out of a job. Adhering to a, an appropriate quote that I heard recently, a good teacher becomes progressively unnecessary. Often, tutoring does the opposite, as an unproductive dependency is built when answers are divulged too willingly. We prefer to answer questions with questions. One of our tutors once shared that a student asked her why she couldn't be more like her other tutors and just give them the answers. She was doing it right. One of my mottos is, if you can make a difference in the two hours that you're working with a student, that's great. But if you can change the way the student thinks the other 166 hours of the week, now you're truly changing a life. The secret sauce in our program is that the students and tutors truly see themselves in each other. That leads to confidence that is simultaneously being fostered in both groups. Our training supports our tutors 
not only as tutors, but more importantly, as learners. The near-peer pay-it-forward model elevates both groups. Learning gains have been seen on both sides, and our tutors graduate and gain jobs commensurate with their degree at a rate that is almost triple their low-income peers. Now, these ideas can lead to similar results in your classrooms, at your homes, or wherever learning is taking place. Peer mentorship can be prioritized and monitored in your comfortable environments. As educators and students, we need to be focused on the right things. My students are often curious how much of their undergraduate knowledge they'll need in their first job. I place a conservative estimate around 25%. But there are two very important caveats. One, you don't know which 25%. And two, it's not about that. It's about demonstrating to your teacher, and more importantly to yourself, that you are capable of independent learning, of critical thinking. That's what you're going to need to do in that first job. Apply fundamentals to a new environment. The more confident you are in doing so, the more effective and employable you'll be. If we are doing our job correctly, that's what we're trying to do here in college, create independent, autonomous learners. There's a final quote that I'd like to share. I often suggest that my students catalyze serendipity, catalyze to accelerate a response or reaction. Serendipity happenstance, a happy accident, something that happens at just the right moment. So how do you speed up good luck? Easy. You prepare for it. You set the stage for good luck to happen. You don't wait for tomorrow. If you have a dream, put it out there into the world. I taught a professional development course once and read a shocking statistic. 70% of jobs are obtained through word of mouth. Students need to be networking. Effective networking puts you in a position to be on the minds of others when opportunities arise. When students tell me they're interested in an internship or talk about their future, they're at the forefront of my mind. They're not waiting. They're catalyzing serendipity. For many, this isn't easy. Sounds like a great place to apply productive struggle. I came here today with a long list of things to share. My fundamental goal was to promote good teaching and good learning. As a teacher, I genuinely hope this was helpful. Thank you.